Good morning, Revolution, and welcome to uh, this week. We're very happy to see all of you here uh, this day, uh, September 11th, and we remember those who uh, died uh, in the World Trade Center uh, bombing, uh, the planes that wrecked in both in New York and in DC and in Pennsylvania. A lot of working class people perished on that day. And the fight against terrorism and right wing politics in all forms continues. Uh, we got uh, Michael here with us this morning. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, how are you? And uh, Rosanna is here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, and it's smoky out there in LA. Uh, Rosanna, we hope everybody's uh, safe. And Yeah, that's not fog, oh my, everybody. That's smoke. Not fog, it's smoke, no. have mercy. Or the and smog. Anita is here with us from uh, Columbus. Good morning, uh, Anita. Good morning, Revolution. And Scott um, got a new haircut. And good morning. And he's uh, upstate New York, hanging out in um, the parking lot of in his uh, automobile. Um, <laughs> we're glad that everybody has been able. It's been one hell of a week. Now, one of the top things in the news uh, has been the book by Mr. Woodward from the Washington Post. Uh, it's called Rage, Rage. Trump is an angry man. Uh, I guess I haven't read the book, but I've read some of the reviews. And, and um, Michael, it seems that uh, Woodward discovered back in March that the president, February, that they knew that the virus was transmitted by air, and they knew it was five times as potent, as uh, more, more potent, not as potent than the flu. And the son of a gun didn't say now word about it. What do you think about that? Well, I wonder why he's been sitting on the information then since January or March. In fact, yesterday, so you're blaming Woodward. Yeah, yesterday in the park, um, when we were with the comrades handing out, you know, literature and doing voter registration, the most common uh, question we were getting was, "What do the communists think of Woodward and this new news coming out?" That was the word on the street yesterday, quite literally. And so, you know, it's a shame that uh, Trump lied. Trump lied, and Americans died. Um, and, you know, Woodward, I, at least I understand, he has connections uh, to the Watergate scandal, at least when he was younger. And so, you know, Lord knows what other information is going to come out. At, at this on top of what Michael Cohen said just earlier this week, it, just, it gets worse and worse. We just have to defeat this guy. We have to defeat it up and down the ballot because it's only going to get worse from here. Rosanna, do you think that, that, that these revelations are going to make a difference in the election? I sure hope so. <clears throat> you know, I, I don't hold my breath anymore because there's been so many scandals related to Trump and so many things. And yet his, you know, his base, although I, I've seen reports that his base is getting smaller. Mm. But the problem with that is that his base actually is the one that goes out to vote. And that's where it makes it look like he's got the majority. So I agree with Michael that, <clears throat> and others who have been saying, we have to get out there and vote. If we can go out there and vote, we can do this. But we just can't just complain. We have to get out the vote. We have to call our family and friends to go out and vote. Uh, it, this is ridiculous. I had a friend who died from COVID. And, you know, it wasn't a close friend, but still it hurts. I can just imagine the, what is it, 200,000 or, or so people who have lost their loved ones to COVID and that rage that they must feel knowing that their loved one could have been saved had, had, the, had the president uh, taken action, especially that because he knew already about all of this. It's just disgusting. Yes, I saw a woman from the West Coast, uh, not the West Coast, but someplace out in the, in the Western part of the country. Her dad was a Trump supporter, didn't wear a mask, and they had her on the news and uh, she was like, you know, uh, because of his trust in the presidency, he ended up dying. And he could have, if he had listened to reason, 
uh, survive. That must really hurt bad. But Anita in Ohio, I saw this morning that uh, one talking head said that, well, you got Trump's base, and then you got the, uh, the Democratic base on the other side, and, and then you got 5% mm -hmm. who are movable. They're a movable feast of people right. who might be influenced. Mm -hmm. Do you think in Ohio it's 5%? And, uh, I, you know, I, that sounds about right. I think it's 48% committed to, to both candidates. And, and I think something like this Woodward book will um, will make a difference. And I think the the anti-military uh, stuff that came out last week will make a little difference. And I think all of these things hopefully will chip away at that at that soft Trump vote anyway. And when when I read that title Rage, I was I thought it was kind of ambiguous whether we, it meant that was what was going to be in the minds of readers when they read this. I mean, I felt rage when I heard about it. Um, but I think to deflect the the, the um, injury to Woodward instead of Trump, uh, I think is is following uh, the playbook that Trump wants us to turn that deflect the attention on Woodward. There were lots of people telling us that we didn't have to depend on Donald Trump to know this was a serious illness. I remember it being reported out in the end of January and in February. So. I never believe, I mean, we never believed Trump. So we have to believe other people. Um, and I don't, I don't blame Woodward for holding on to it until just the right time in the election campaign to make a difference. The important point, but Scott, I just don't understand, man. How could it be that it's still, okay, in Ohio it's neck and neck, 47, 47. And in the rest of the country, you know, um, there's a 7% difference in favor of the Democrats. But how could it be so close? I mean, what? Well, I mean, After so, all of these revelations, you know, well, of COVID, on his racism, on his attacks on the military, on it's just well, one I mean, thing after an. What the heck? You know, his, the, the whole notion of fake news has, has become, is a really powerful one. Um, there are, you know, people who, many people who refuse to accept, you know, things that are published in um, what we would consider mainstream uh, sources, CNN, the New York Times, things like that, as, um, as representing any kind of reliable information and instead, um, you know, are, are guided by these conspiracy theory websites. And the blame for that, I think, lies you know, principally with the with the Trump forces in the ruling class and the, the really? amount of money. Because don't you think that the mass media, the big news corporations have some culpability too? In oh, yeah, absolutely. Real that was, that was, that's the point it, I was getting to. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because, you know, they've, um, people, you know, uh, how many, how many lies have people been, been sold on the economy, on, um, on everything, um, you know, by these, these, yeah. Uh, the New York Times is not a working class news source. The Washington Post is not a working class news source. It represents, you know, a faction of the ruling class, and that faction of the ruling class has also not done well by the working class. And and that's you know that's something that Dimitrov brings out. Um, the reason that fascism uh, can bring part of the working class into its base, into its supporters, is that. Um, social democratic parties or parties sort of um, that, that claim to re represent the working class but actually don't do it um, sort of weaken things. That, that betrayal opens the door for, for fascism. So the, the blame has to be shared. Now, Rosanna, you know, I know that you work with the uh, military families and I was so, you know, I was really kind of just like outraged with the Trump's uh, demagogy, you know, is fake populism, where this week he attacked the general, and there's an element of truth in what he's saying, uh, saying that, um, well, you know, these generals, uh, all they're interested in is propping up the profits of the military corporation after he himself presided over the biggest military buildup in modern history. 
and giving these huge contracts to these big corporations, Lockheed and others, and saying, oh, no, we can't mess with their profit margin. This is really important for national defense. What a bunch of fakery, don't you think? Definitely. I mean, it's it's just outrageous. Everything that he says is outrageous. And, and <laughs> you know, it, it really, we, we have to urge people to think about what is being said, to step outside of their little box just for a moment so that they can look from the outside in and, and, and feel comfortable in making sure that they are doing the right thing on November, on November 3rd, whether it's sitting it out, voting, even voting for him or whatever. But, you know, people have to make a, a, a strategic move come November 3rd. But based on, you know, I think looking from the outside in, I think once you do that, you, you know, the, the fog will clear, <laughs> the smoke will, clear, will clear and you'll be, able to, right. you'll be able to see it. Yeah. Very, very <laughs> important idea, particularly when you're being choked by wow, by these fires out in the, on the West Coast in California and mm -hmm. Oregon. And I thought that with the families and everybody trying to stay alive uh, in that very difficult situation. Now, Michael, the young communists are out there doing voter tabling and mutual aid and, and voter registration, and you got a petition. How, what's that been like? It's been a very positive response. We've been doing it for about, I'd say, three months nonstop um, on Thursdays. Three months, wow. Three months Hold nonstop. Um, and we basically, it, it picked up in light of the George Floyd protest during the month of June. Mm -hmm. And then ever since, you know, the protests have kind of died down, it's really been our main focus. And so we've been doing voter registration, um, you know, sitting outside of our building in New York or going to public parks or busy subway stations, doing voter registration, handing out food, water, you know, um, PPE, you know, hand sanitizer, gloves, so forth. It's been a really positive reaction. And then you, from there, you can have these conversations about, you know, what is the Communist Party all about? Uh, do you want to fight for unemployed, uh, un your unemployed neighbors, family members, friends, you know, sign our petition to fight for the unemployed. And it's just a really good way to kind of um, combat so many things at once, combat the fascist danger by, you know, registering these folks to vote, combat anti-communism by explaining what the party is handing out our literature. And so it's just, it serves so many purposes. And it's just such a, we have so many rewarding um, uh, conversations, which often start out, you know, very sad with people saying, you know, I've been unemployed you know, since March and, you know, my $600 a week ran out. I don't have, you know, my, and that's what our petition's for actually, calling on uh, people to, to rally for the $600 a week again. And so it's just so rewarding to, to, to hear these, you know, working class experiences and to bring them in um, to the radicalization process, I guess you can say, get them united around these issues, organize them, radicalize them and build the party. Hey, young guy told me yesterday that I'm, I'm 18 years old. He says I'm a forklift operator in Kentucky and my vote don't count. Mm. And I was so saddened by that because if they convince you that your vote doesn't count, then they really got you, you know. Um, we have a campaign right now, Scott. We're telling, asking people to pledge to vote, to organize other people to vote, to register uh, and, uh, and to vote on the issues, you know. Take a look at where people stand on the $600, on PPE, uh, on um, housing, on student debt, um, you know, on, on uh, you know, whether or not you're going to be able to pay your rent and do something about it. So you can go to our website at cpusa.org, or you can go to our Facebook page if you're watching this on Facebook, and you can pledge to do something, you know? Even if you don't like the candidates, do something. Uh, protest, organize uh, a fight because it's gonna take the fight to win this thing. You were about to say something, Scott? Yeah, um, I was gonna say, you know, I had a really interesting uh, conversation over email yesterday. Um, a guy uh, wrote to me a while back asking some questions about the party. And I, I you know, gave him some answers. And he wrote back to me yesterday and said, you know, thanks for sending me your answers. I have a few more questions. You know, I've been voting Republican for 30 years, but mm -hmm. I'm starting to think that maybe, you know, some of the stuff the Communist Party is talking about is really 
you know, makes sense. Um, so, it, and that was, um, it was encouraging to me because, you know, we're, we're a party of the working class, the whole working class and, and you know, winning back or winning um, the section of our class that, that has come under the sway of, of a party and a regime that is absolutely contrary to their interests is a, you know, it's a, it's a big priority for us, I think. Um, so that was Very encouraging. True. Very true. Now we need communist candidates. Anita, when are you going to run for governor of Ohio uh, as an independent or on the Communist Party ticket? I mean, I'm not sure I want that job. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it would be good to have some Communist Party candidates, but, but um, you really have to choose so strategically carefully uh, where, where you, where, what we do with elections. I think Elections are a great way to get, um, get to get to know other activists in your community and to work together on on projects that you that you want to see happen, whether it's at the national level or the state level or the local level. And it's I think I think everybody should get involved in a in a in the campaign in some way that you want, even even if none of the candidates for your in your own area interest you. Nowadays, with phone banking, you can you can be a, a a a worker for a campaign across the country. So you know, there's something for everybody in the 2020 elections. I'm sure. So sure, you can vote for you can campaign for AOC in New York or one of the squad in Minnesota or in St. Louis or in Washington State or wherever it might be. Or you can do it on a local issue. There are ballot initiatives and all kinds of things taking place. But it's important to get the biggest vote out there, the largest vote, even in places like New York and California that are considered to be safe, uh, safe state, safe state. Some, because the one of the young people wanted Rosanna and I to run uh, for the presidency. They wanted us to do a, a writing campaign, you know? And I said, that's a great idea. So Rosanna is my president. <laughs> uh, but we said that, you know, not this election cycle because yeah. we face such a big danger from uh, the, the right wing, from the fascist element. Even when uh, Michael, we're not endorsing, uh, we're not, and we want to be very clear about that. Uh, because no matter what you say, people say, well, you're secretly endorsing them. You just don't want to come out and say it. No, no, we're not. We're endorsing uh, the issues. Is that resonating amongst the young people you're talking to, Michael? You know, here in New York, um, I think it is. I think because people here, um, young people who may be, you know, studying in school or, you know, graduated high school and they're working to make a living or they're in school because their parents tell them to and then they graduate and they can't find a job. They're frustrated with the system. Sometimes they can't put an, uh, a face with a name. They don't know the system's capitalism. You know, They don't know socialism could be the alternative, but they're frustrated with whatever this is and they don't like it. And so when you tell them, you know, of course both candidates suck and they're both you know, uh, corporate parties, but if you make it about the issues, they can't disagree with you. Mm -hmm. Of course we wanna fight for Medicare for all. It's the middle of a pandemic. Of course, we want to fight for a Green New Deal. You know, the, the earth is burning, literally. And, uh, you know, we need jobs. So people, if you, when you make it about working class unity around issues, right, which working class unity has to precede leftist unity. You know, a lot of people say they're for left unity, but you can't have one without the other, right? And so- Speaking right of now, issues. Yeah, and if- Speaking the unity, of issues, you know, what about the issue of anti-racist education? I mean, now Trump says no more- sensitivity training is so is divisive anita yeah well i i'm not a big fan of uh that sensitivity training they have because i think it gives people the idea that um the the problem with racism is because certain individuals have the wrong attitudes um where really structural uh issues really is what what holds people back and creates racial and maintains racial inequality but to say that um, that these these programs, I mean, they're they're good for. I think they're 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 positive in their their purpose. And not only the uh, anti-racism education does he want to get rid of in federal programs, but he wants to um, defund schools that use the 1619 project uh, as part of part of their educational uh, curriculum, which is just 
Well, he can't do it, but, uh, and it's been pointed out that he'll, he'll never succeed in that, but just to, to want to do it is, is wrong. It's, it's anti, anti-fact again, as Trump is. So, oh, so Scott, is it, is it nurture or nature? Is it sensitivity or structure in your opinion? This is an interesting I think it, twist in the conversation. Well, I'm, I think that the, the real question here for me has to do with uh, in what way this is a sign of the, the increase in the fascist threat, right? Because what Trump is doing is trying to sell a certain image of the United States uh, as, you know, this uh, magical, exceptional land of opportunity, we're all united, et cetera, et cetera. And his approach to doing that, his approach to every problem, in fact, in his presidency has been to, you know, like push away, lock up, wall out, erase, suppress everything that doesn't fit into that picture, right? So he did it with the, that's what the border wall is about. That's what his comments on the, the um, housing crisis and, and homelessness in California were about um, the, his take on the 1619 project and the history of white supremacy. It's just, if you don't like it, just cover it up, kill it, wall it out, get rid of it. Um, and that is a really dangerous thing because it sells, it makes people think of what the nation is as a sort of image to be consumed rather than as a real living political entity that's, that's you know, contradictory and striving for democracy and, and things like that. It's, and, and that for me is really kind of at the heart of, of what fascism tries to do, um, uh, replace you know, a people engaged in a democratic project with this um, static kind of dead image of greatness uh, or something. I don't know if but that makes any sense at all. Racist education in that respect is very important. And uh, uh, workshops and, and uh, discussions uh, about these issues, whether you want to call them sensitivity or something else, uh, are an important. And so, in his effort to shop another uh, imagine. Uh, uh, imaginary scenario, uh, he's saying that we don't need that, right? Anybody? I mean, I'll jump to one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and it's really telling that he's taken the 1619 project as the, you know, the uh, the target of his his rage, um, uh, because you know it's been so. Um, powerful in bringing to, to mass consciousness the idea that, you know, the, the republic has been deeply flawed since its beginning, deformed by, by white supremacy and by the enslavement of Africans and, you know, the genocide of Native people. So th those questions are, um, have been really, have been made prominent and, and kind of inescapable. And he's trying to sort of comfort people and say, oh yeah, you can, you don't have to worry about any of that, but it's, yeah. In my opinion, we have to address both ideas and structures, part of a simultaneous fight. And I got the last word because we have come to the end of our time. So we want to thank everybody for uh, joining us this morning. We're going to continue the discussion next week. We're going to continue it until November the 3rd. We're probably going to be talking about it until Inauguration Day, because it looks like it's going to be a dogfight from now until we are able to marshal the strength of the democratic forces across the country to defeat uh, at least this stage of the fascist danger. And we got a webinar coming up. What date is that, Michael? September 27th. It's a Sunday. September 8th. 27th. Be there or be square. It's going to be led by Mark Brodeen. Check us out. Uh, at cpusa.org. Check us out here on Facebook. Check us out on YouTube. Check us out on Twitter. Check us out on Instagram. Uh, and when you check us out, check the box to join the Communist Party. Take a revolutionary act today so that we can have a socialist future tomorrow. Thank you very much. Uh, have a great weekend, everybody. Stay strong and safe, physically distant, but socially close.
Talk to you Bye. later. Bye. 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 Later, comrades. Bye.